and welcome to the Manchester is Blue show. And today uh, we're having a chat with ex City player Gordon Davies. Gordon, how are you doing, my friend? Well, I'm doing okay, as most City supporters are at the moment, especially after the, the result this evening. Yes. It's, um, for, for the best part of the game, game, 90 minutes, they're in charge. A few mm. sort of setbacks, uh, offset pieces. But the last six minutes, it's typical City and everybody's on the edge of their seat again. Yeah, but to be fair, um, I don't mind Bournemouth as a team. Um, they're not like uh, a team that just like plays long balls or whatever. They do try and play football and um, I don't know, I'm a bit disappointed they're going down. But, hey oh. <laughs> it looks like it and uh, it's a shame really that two of the subs, they're, they're both young Welsh internationals, uh, yeah. they came through, um, and it just seems strange when the game is that close. And I know you can look at it in hindsight, but yeah. when the game is that close, do you just go from it from the off? Because yeah. they were one nil in six minutes. Yeah. Do you go through and put your attacking players on and take the game to City? And if you get beaten by a better team, you get beaten by a better team. But it's uh, they feel more disappointed by just giving it a go for six minutes at the end. Yeah, I mean, to be fair though, it was a beautiful goal by David Silva and Jesus as were a good goal as well. I mean, how Jesus can score that and then miss three tappings is beyond me. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a typical forward who's not playing week in, week out. Yeah, well, obviously, you're a forward, you send uh, Gordon, so you'll be able to tell us the truth, will it? Now then, <laughs> so, um, to just start from the beginning, uh, Obviously, you were £100,000 signing from Chelsea in uh, '85. is that right? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I joined um, October 85 yeah. and uh, I was only there 12 months. I wanted it to be longer. Um, I left October 86 yeah, no. to go back to London. But um, the, the move really came out of the blue when I was at uh, Chelsea. Um, at the beginning of the season, um, John Hollins took over the manager's job yeah. and he promised or gave me his word, I wouldn't say promised, but gave me his word on a few things that uh, were going to happen pre-season and into yeah. the season. And the first game of the season came about and I wasn't in the starting 11. I wasn't even on the subs bench. I was playing, I think it was in the reserves away at Swindon. So yeah. I just went in on Monday morning, uh, asked to see him, spent three minutes in his office with him and his assistant manager, yeah. and it handed a transfer request in. Um, right. So literally, um, although they still used me when David Speedy was getting suspended or sent off left, right and centre, yeah. um, it came about then when um, Chelsea went up to play at Main Road. Yeah. And Man City hammered them, yeah. but Chelsea won the game, I think, 1-0. Yeah. Typical City. Yeah, yeah. in those days, yes. So, um, the uh, vice-chairman, uh, Freddie Pulley, again, obviously, before your time, um, he had a word with Ken Bates after. And, yeah. um, as they were having a drink together, he said, um, we should have hammered you today. If we had somebody to put the ball in the back of the net, we would have beaten you easily. Yeah. And Bates just said, well, we've got a lad down at Chelsea that wants away, um, a lad called Davis. So Freddie Pye sort of thought for a couple of seconds and said, well, Davis, the lad that used to be at Fulham? He said, yeah. He said, um, he's not happy. He's put in a transfer request. Um, do you want to talk to him? So Freddie said, yes. He said, I'll speak to him tonight um, and then I'll ring you back. Mm. So 10 o'clock at night, I've played in the reserves. I've come home early. Me and the missus have gone out. I've had a few mm. uh, The phone goes at 10 o'clock and uh, Sue went to answer it. And then she looked at me and she said, it's Ken Bates. <laughs> so I'm 10 o'clock on the Saturday night, Bates is not going to phone me. So I, I, I'll keep my side of it uh, quite uh, uh, level-headed. So I said, yeah. I said, give me the phone. So I picked up the phone with the wife and I said, Oh, Batesy, what the, are you doing calling me at 10 o'clock at night? <laughs> thinking, thinking it's one of my mates. And um, he said, oh, Gordon, uh, uh, he said, um, 
it's Ken here. I went, oh, I said, sorry, sorry, Mr. Chairman. I said, I, I, do, I thought it was a prank. He said, we were up at City today. To cut a long story short, do you want to speak to them? They're interested in talking to you. I, so I said, yeah. I said, when, when are they going to phone up? He said, um, I'll phone Freddie Pye now and he'll call you at 10 o'clock in the morning. So literally, the phone went 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I, didn't sleep, I didn't sleep a wink that night. And yeah. he said, would you be interested in coming up and having a chat? So I yeah. said, yes. And literally, I went up, I flew up. They arranged for a flight for me from Heathrow on Monday. I flew yeah. up, had a chat with him and Billy McMillan. Um, came back on the Monday evening, came back up on the Thursday, signed on Thursday, yeah, and then literally met the first team at Watford on the Saturday, and I played on Saturday at Watford. For, <laughs> unfortunately, we lost, uh, yeah. but I played at the Courage Road on the Saturday, and it was all done and dusted in two meetings, because really, um, having been at City from a 15-year-old, or as yeah. a 15-year-old, um, but not taken on. Um, I shall I say I changed allegiances, which most people know about. <laughs> I used to support my local club in in South Wales when I was a, a Merthyr boy. I used to support my local club, which played in red, and it was yeah. called Manchester United. <laughs> and um, uh, I went up there at fifteen to sixteen years of age. Met. The first team then, which was Bell, Lee, Summerby, Corrigan, Oaks. Good team then, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And, and I went to a, a pre-season game at Port Vale and the whole team just took, basically, they took the mickey out of me uh, yeah. because I was this young, young 15, 16-year-old from a little village in South Wales. So I changed allegiances in that 12 months but, and went from a red to a blue. And yeah. I've been in blue ever since. So when I knew mm. City were interested, I just couldn't wait to get up there and, and chat to them about it. I mean, it's brilliant that, isn't it, to say, like you say, you, you change your allegiances and to be a City fan and get get the opportunity to play for the club. Um, oh, yeah. It, it must have just been fantastic. Now, um, I mean, we'll, we'll go on. I mean, um, you score, am I right in thinking your first goal were against Leeds in the Cup and you scored a hat-trick? Is that right or am I wrong? Or is that your first hat-trick for City? <laughs> Yes, yeah, it was. It, I think we played Watford on the Saturday, and I think we played Leeds at home in the full Members Cup, maybe. Yeah. Um, and we beat them 6 1 um, in front of probably only about 4,500 people because nobody, yeah. was support, nobody was supporting the club in, in cup games, and it was a, um, a Mickey Mouse trophy or, or cup that everybody thought it was. And yeah. it's Tilly Gordon, it is unless you win it, though, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. one unless you win it. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, I got three against Leeds and got off to a, a flying start. Um, and you think, well, everything is hunky dory. Let's um, uh, let's see how we can go on from here. Mm. But but yeah, it was uh, it was just nice to score to get on the score sheet when you're a forward. You just yeah. want to get on the score sheet as, as early as you can, and it doesn't matter how they go in. Uh, mm. But to get three on my home debut, yeah, it was fantastic. But I mean, you must have been in like dreamland. So, like you say, you you came up on the Friday, you played on the Saturday, and then you scored an hat trick on the Tuesday or Wednesday. Do you know what I mean? That, you must have just thought, well, this has been the dream move for me. Well, you you start thinking it, it, it's a fantastic move because it's the club I've supported as a kid. Um, you 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 get get to the club. And you walk through the doors and you walk out and you have a look at Main Road. And mm. I, I, I don't think I've ever, well, I don't think I've, I've, I've played there once with Fulham, I believe. Yeah. But when you then think and you look around, this is your, your home ground. And especially when you play there and there's sort of 30, 35,000 and the kit yeah. is full. Yeah. And it's, it is a dream come true. But you, yeah. sometimes you're going to pinch yourself and you think, well, um, it's not going to be as easy. I'm not going to score three every game. So yeah. you've, got to take, you've got to take the good with the bad. But when it's going well, you've just got to enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, like, you played that season, because it were only the season, you played 42 games, scoring 15 goals. Now, that isn't a bad return. And, I mean, I don't know how many assists you got because they weren't kept back then, were they? But 
That yeah. isn't a bad return to say a, a squad that got relegated, is it? So, well, no, considering that um, although I played up front the majority of the time with Mark Lillis, yeah. Mark, Mark wasn't really a renowned centre forward. Yeah. So it was like a bit of a mismatch. Mark, when I played against him when he was at Huddersfield, he was a powerful wide midfield player. He yeah. used to bomb, bomb down the line and brush people out of the way. But he wasn't a centre forward. And mm. although we did okay together, it was never a partnership that was going to uh, set the world on fire, as it were. Right. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I've sort of, sort of kept up my goal average over the I don't know, 500 games that I've played of scoring a goal every two to two and a half games. Yeah. Um, it's a shame at City that we didn't have a ready-made centre forward that I, I clicked with and we made a, yeah. like a, a partnership up front. But it was, it was enjoyable to play with Mark, but it was never going to be a, a partnership that was going to probably get the club 40 goals a season, which is what you were mm. looking for. With with two two forwards in those days, yeah. You see, I mean, that must be hard as a striker to have to uh, to think that. I bet. Do you know what I mean? I, I bet. Yeah. Um, I bet that's an awkward situation to be in. If you knew that, then you must have been proper awkward. But I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure David White were coming through the youth team round about then, weren't they? Yeah, there were there were quite a, about four or five of the lads coming through. Um, Paul Moulton was one. Who uh, was there? Uh, Whitey was there. Obviously, the the the, uh, the two brothers, uh, Brightwell. um, Brightwells, uh, Steve Redmond. Steve Redmond was coming through. Andy Hinchliffe was coming through. Mm. And I think I think it, it would have been um, it would have been interesting to have seen some of those in the first team for short bursts. But I, I think the problem that Billy McNeil tried to do I think because they won the youth cup the, the, the yeah. season prior I think what was happening with uh, with Tony Buck he was trying to force a lot of the youngsters into this into the squad and into the team yeah and I just think that, to be perfectly honest with you a few of them or five or six of them were put in too early for a long period of time and generally yeah. you want to come in for three four five games bring them back out Another ten games later, put him in, in for another four, five, six games. Yeah. Um, but the way that they were trying to do things, I think they were trying to bring a lot of them on very, very quickly. And yeah. you, we, we sort of had, um, I wouldn't say not settled teams week in week out. But it, they were all with changes. Yeah. And um, and yeah, there were some very, very good youngsters coming through. But I think they needed to be managed, in my opinion, a, a lot better. And just trying to chuck them all in and hoping it it, it, all, it all goes well. Yeah, and I suppose um, back then uh, there were a lot more respect for pros and senior players, and uh, there was a lot more respect in the game, wasn't there, in the dressing room? I'm I'm, I'm gather when you were coming through in dressing room when you were a, a YTS or youth player, you didn't you didn't talk if a first team member were talking and clean boots. You, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, to be perfectly honest with you, when I when I was released um, at 16, yeah, the, the, the bottom drops out of your world, yeah. as it were, because you think you've done it, you're on school by forms, you're looking to become an apprentice in those days. And um, it, 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 took a, it took a good six months for me to get into my head that I would never be a professional footballer because mm. I've been told I'm not good enough by the club that I, that I, that I support. So mm. you, look, you look at other options, but looking back in hindsight, when I've got to Fulham and you look at the way that the youth team players, the apprentices were actually treated in those days, yeah. and it, it was full on, nose to nose, shouting my head off at you if I'm the coach and you're the 16 year old. Yeah. To get them to try to grow up quickly. Mm. Now you can't manage like that. It's no. very nicey, nicey, feely, touchy, um, and you've got to take a step back before you start shouting at a sixteen-year-old. You know, yeah. If they're shouting at me at sixteen, 
I was a shy kid anyway. I think yeah. I would have probably gone into my shell and at yeah. 17 been released. But yeah. I, learned, I learned the hard way going through non-league. Um, and uh, it, it, it was in good stead that I came into the game at 22 rather than at 16. Yeah. Well, that's, that's it, though. Uh, but I'm not being funny, God. You'll know yourself. If you can't get shouted at by your coach, who's your mate, are you going to go going up against Man United as an 18-year-old, like, say, right back? You're right next to the fans, just getting a dog's abuse. It, you need to make a man of yourself, really, don't you? You've, you've, got to, you've got to, because once you're out on that pitch, nobody else is going to do it for you. There's, yeah. okay, I got kicked up in the air. There were other players in my teams throughout my career that, shall I say, looked after me. Yeah. And they'd walk, they'd walk past as I'm sort of screaming on the floor, and they'd say, don't worry, Ivor, his card's marked. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. But when... Things are going badly for you. And as you say, at Old Trafford with 60,000 there and you're having a horrendous time, you've got to mm. come through yourself and you've got to grow up there. And you've yeah. Sometimes, okay, the old adage, if you're old enough, you're good enough. But I've seen experienced players go in their shell when mm. there, there's sort of 60,000 people having a go at you. It's, it's yeah. hard to think, especially when you're having a bad time. And I've missed goals from a yard out. Yeah. So well, you, you know what's coming your way, that you couldn't score in a brothel and everything yeah. of that nature. You just got to go back into the next chance. It would only yeah. be too easy for me to then stay outside the box. And when that ball's fizzing across the six-yard box, I'm nowhere to be seen. That's yeah. just how you do. And when you're up front and you're a goal scorer, You've got to keep missing, you've got to keep missing. And you pray the next chance goes in and it's as simple as that, but you've got to stand up and be counted. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was speaking to um, Ian Fisher uh, recently and this was before football actually restarted and uh, I was talking about, you know, there'd been no fans. And oh, yeah. I said, wrongly by the way, I said, I think we'll see different John Stones. I said, no fans there. No pressure. I thought John Stones would have come and really took the ball by the horns. But he still looks a bag of nerves. And like you say, if he's, if he's like that in an empty stadium with his teammates around him, what's going to be like starting next yeah. season when people's on his back? And, that, and that's the thing. Sometimes moves just don't work out. Yeah. And he, he came with a big price tag, a big reputation. And, and I think everybody thought he's the answer to our centre-back problems. Yeah. And he's been making silly mistakes or, or, or ricks since he, since he came. Yeah. And I think, to be perfectly honest with you, I think you, 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 you're right in what you say. To be perfectly honest with you, even, even in, in the Bournemouth game, him and Otamendi and, are not a partnership. And both no. of them, both of them, as far as supporters are concerned, are just waiting for when that rick comes along and you go one nil down. Yeah. Um, and it, it is a shame, um, but I think, to be perfectly honest with you, both of those really need to be moved on at some point in the near future. And yeah. uh, looking at a different... Uh, certainly, they're not going to hold first-team spots down, but uh, with uh, uh, Laporte, he's, he's a quality player. On the board. But, but as you say... John Stones, yeah. Even if you pass tonight as a as a reserve team game and there's nobody there, he still looks a bag of nerves. Yeah. Well, anyway, Gordon, we'll carry on talking about you. <laughs> well, let's right, see if we've got you on. Now, uh, obviously, coming from Chelsea, and you actually got to the final of the full members' cup to uh, lose five four. I bet you thought though. I bet you were secretly thinking this is going to be my time. Well, it was. It was a weird weekend um, because five of I think five of us were rested for the old uh, the Manchester derby at Old Trafford, and I remember I was sitting in the stand next to Mick McCarthy, and we were chatting about the game and how it was going, and then we were chatting about the following day, and um, Mick said to me, he said, um, he said, I bet you're really looking to play in against Chelsea tomorrow. I said, well, yeah. I said I would have loved to have played today in the Manchester Derby because I've never played in the Manchester Derby. Um, I said, but obviously five of us have been left out. All yeah. five of us are going to be playing tomorrow. 
So I'm really looking forward to it. So we went down to um, the, the Wickham area to stay in a hotel on that Saturday night after the Old Trafford game. And um, not much was said about the Sunday. We went out for a walk, about a half an hour, 40 minute walk in, in the grounds where that close to the hotel. And for 10, 15 minutes of that half an hour, 45 minute walk, I was walking with, with Big Bill. Yeah. And it was all small talk. It was all about the wife, the, the house that we'd moved into. Um, hopefully you settled down now. And there was nothing about the game. Yeah. I thought, well, it's a bit strange. He's not even mentioned the game this afternoon. Um, or even taken me to one side because we weren't all walking in a group as we're walking along and just said, look, what I want you to do this afternoon, you know yeah. the players there, you know we've always done well against them, um, just go out and enjoy yourself. Would have been, would have been great. We didn't say anything. Um, we didn't have a team meeting, which we usually do at the hotel. So nobody knew the team. And, uh, we got to Wembley. Um, we had a walk around, uh, get used to the, the, the pitch and the surroundings. Then we went all in the changing rooms, and um, I was sitting in between um, Neil McNabb and Graham Baker. Yeah. And so uh, Bill says, the team today is, and he read the team out and he read the sub. And Neil McNabb nudged me in the ribs and he went, he said, I didn't hear your name. And I said, I didn't either. And then Graham mm -hmm. Baker said, he said, what have you, what have you done? to the boss. I said, well, I've done nothing. I said, I was walking with him for 15 minutes this morning. <laughs> so as soon as he mentioned the team, I just literally got up, even before we had a, a, a team meeting, I got up, I wished the lads all the best, walked out of the changing rooms and went for a walk by myself on the pitch. And the Chelsea lads were still out there. So I called Joey Jones over and, um, he said, you're looking forward to it today. He said, I'll get you. I'll get you. Um, mm. And he said, I'm not playing. And he told me where to go. He says, you've got to be playing. He said, yeah. uh, you've, you've always scored against us in the past, even when you're at Fulham. Uh, he said, uh, I said, no, I said, I'm being serious, Joe. I said, I'm not playing. Um, I said, I'm not even sub. Um, so he called uh, Joe McLaughlin over. He called Colin Pates over. Um, and he said, Ivor's not playing. And they told me to where to go as well. And I said, <laughs> I said, if I was playing, I said, I'd tell you. I said, but I'm not playing. I'm not even sub. And it gave Chelsea a lift because mm -hmm. someone recently sent me a, a, through um, a magazine, a Chelsea magazine, which was brought out for that final. Yeah. And literally everybody that they've spoken to, being players, ex-players, ex-managers, They've all said one person you've got to be wary of is Gordon Davis because yeah. he's quick, he's got a knife for goal, he's always scored against us. He's the person that you've got to watch out for. So as far as Chelsea were concerned, it was Christmas. It was Christmas Day because um, I wasn't playing. And mm. when we then came out when the, the ground is full, I was walking past the city supporters and even some of the city supporters were calling out my name because we were walking around on the um, on the stand, uh, yeah. like the green track area. Yeah. And even some city supporters were shouting to me and saying, "Are you injured?" I said, "No." I said, I'm, I've, "I've been dropped." So they couldn't believe it. Um, they were giving Big Big Bill some stick then when he came anywhere near them. Um, but I basically missed two cup finals in one in one weekend, and. Yeah. To this day, I do not know why I was dropped uh, from the cup final team. Well, do you reckon um, it was just in that thinking, well, Chelsea played for Chelsea, they might know him, they might know his weaknesses, or... Well, I mean, but if, if that were the case, he'd have played you against Man United, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. Jesus. I was, I was up at uh, Main Road for the... Uh, sorry, I was up at the Etihad... It's, all, it's awkward to get main road out of my head. Um, <laughs> I, was up the, I was up at the Etihad for the Fulham FA Cup game this season. Oh, yeah. And, and I, bumped in, I bumped into Tony Book. And so I asked him, 
I said, uh, I said, Bucky, can you remember when we played Chelsea in the final at Wembley? And he said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, did Big Bill say anything to you about the, the reason why I wasn't playing? And he went, no. He said he, he didn't mention your name at all. And, and, and so your guess is as good as mine. When, you, when, you, when you've come in and you've scored goals for the club and um, you, you've done reasonably well in, in that competition as well and yeah. you're playing against the team who has sold you, if you can't go out and play well against that team, then it's, it, it's just a mind, for me, it's just a mind-blowing decision, which to this day, I just don't know why he did it and he never took it to one side to even explain. So mm-hmm. from that day, um, I'd lost total, or from that weekend then, I'd lost total respect for Billy McNeil. Um, and just thought, what have I got to do just to um, keep my place in the team, as it were? See, um, I mean, obviously it still affected you. It still affected me, but oh, I mean, yeah. you, to be asking Tony Book this year, <laughs> it must still bother you. But, um, well, it, well, it, it does when, when it's not explained to you. Um, and I wasn't going to go in, into him on the Monday um, or the Tuesday. I think we may have had Monday off or the Tuesday to say, well, why didn't I play at the weekend? Mm. It, it, the, the game has gone then um, mm. and uh, it was a, a reasoning before the game that he was resting players because he didn't want people to have a, a hard 90 minutes on the Saturday and yeah. then a hard 90 minutes on the Sunday yeah. but um, there, were, there, were, there were lads there that, that played in the, on the Sunday that played Saturday as well and even speaking to them they thought well I'm playing Saturday I'm not playing Sunday um, and yeah. We got battered Saturday as well, didn't we, against Man United? Uh, no, it ended up a draw. Oh, did it? Yeah, it was a draw. I think we went 1 0, and I think they scored. Well, I can't remember when they scored, but I think it ended up either 1 all or 2 2. Right. Now, um, I'm, I'm surprised about this with Billy McNeil because uh, obviously. Uh, he's, I mean, we've already gone over it, but you're a bit before my time, uh, Gordon, so I had to do a bit of research for this episode. And yeah. Um, Everything I've read about why you left is because Billy McNeil left. So I assumed it, it was you had a good relationship with him, and because he moved on and with and City got relegated, is why you wanted to leave. So yeah, no, it was um, uh, Billy and myself didn't see eye to eye, right. and uh, it was it was first day I signed. Um, I went across to the training ground and. I saw what looked like um, one of the players that, that I would know yeah. 400 yards away with the, with the kids. So I said to Neil McNabb, I said, um, is that Sammy Mack across there? And he said, yeah, he's training with the kids. I said, oh, right. I said, how long has he been coaching the kids up here? And he went, no, no, he's training with the kids. All right. I, I said, I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, he upset Big Bill about three weeks ago and he's been training with the kids for three weeks. Um, so he said, um, just, just, just watch yourself. I thought, well, that's a good that's a good thing to be told on your first day at your new club. So literally, after, after the Saturday game, or, uh, or the Leeds game, um, I did an interview with, um, it might have been the Saturday, with the, the pink, the echo that they used to come out after the game on a Saturday and I think it was David Gardner uh, was, was the reporter yeah. uh, and obviously he was a big City supporter but didn't see eye to eye with Billy McNeil so we start the interview and uh, David said um, uh, right you've had a few days uh, training with, uh, with Pontius um, what do you think of him? Mm. So I said Pontius, I said, who the hell's Pontius? He said, oh, Big Bill. He said, all, 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 all the pressmen call him Pontius. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, he's crucified more players at this club in the three and a half years he's been in charge that it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so so that, that was the two things that I remember that I was told in the first day and the first week that just be careful of, of Big Bill and... Um, yeah. And, and 
as I say, we didn't see eye to eye. When he left, um, he'd, because the board at City at the time, I think, was there, there was about 20 on the board. Yeah. And half liked him, half didn't. It was a yeah. very split, split board. So he'd, he'd had a meeting the week before he went to Villa. And yeah. he, he told the board that they needed to get rid of five players. Yeah. And, and I was one of those five players. And the reason behind getting rid of me was that um, I would not score goals for Man City. Um, and so when he left, I didn't realise this. The first training session that Jimmy Frizzle took, because obviously yeah. Jimmy was um, Big Bill's assistant, um, he pulled me across and he said, oh, I want to have a quick chat with you before we start training. So I said, yeah, yeah. I he said, um, uh, by the way, uh, the board want you and four other players out. And I went, hang on a minute. I said, well, wh where's this come from? And he yeah. said, oh, Big, Big Bill has stabbed five of you in the back. And the board have turned around and said, right, we want to get rid of these five players. And I said, well, hang on a, hang on a minute. I said, this is the first I've heard of this. And yeah. I said, I want to stay here and fight for my place. Because I want to yeah. get in first team, I want to score goals for the city. And all he said to me was, um, "Well, they've made up their mind. If I was you, I'd get a move somewhere, anywhere." And and that was the day the, the day after Big Bill left to go to Villa. So it was on the cards from day one. That, that so he, he absolutely uh, stabbed you in the back. Absolutely, there was no need for that. Oh no, no, and I, and I can't see why he. He did it to five of us um, with regards to it's nothing to do with him. It's somebody else's club. Yeah. He's off. He's looked after himself. He's off to Villa. Um, yeah. But um, that, that was the reasoning uh, behind me. I didn't even look to, to move. All I said to Jimmy Chris, OK, I'll keep my head down and I'll, I'll play wherever you want me to. If that's <laughs> in the reserves, I'll play in the reserves. Um, so... I got put in the reserves. I was in the first team back in the reserves. And then literally he called me one day and said, look, there's two clubs that are interested in uh, talking to you. Uh, one is Leeds and the other is Fulham. Um, so I sat on it for about 24 hours, 48 hours. And I came back in and I looked at the, uh, the squad Leeds had. And of course, 12 months earlier, we'd beaten them 6-1. And yeah. they, looked at, they looked at a terrible team because they were still a second division team in those days. Yeah. So I, I, I thought, I've had enough of politics in football. I've had politics at Chelsea for 12 months. I've now had politics at City for 12 months. So I took the option of having a chat with Ray Lewington at Fulham because A, I knew if I came back, yes, I was dropping two divisions, but if I came back to Fulham, A, I'd be accepted by the supporters uh, B, I know I'm going to score goals playing for no matter how bad a Fulham team is. Um, and thirdly, it was just uh, uh, an option to get out of City as quickly as possible, which, which I didn't want to do. No, um, it's a sad, it, um, sad way sad. for it to go. Oh, it, it was because um, it, I got there with such high hopes and within 12 months, the the, polit the political side of it and the treatment by the by the manager especially um, it was just um, a horrendous situation to be in and uh, mm. you it didn't matter what I seemed to do as you say fifteen goals I think I may, may have got sixteen in in all, all together I think Mark Lillis finished on sixteen that year as well and I think we were joint sort of top goal scorers but. Uh, to score 16 goals in the first season when we hadn't done really well, I was looking forward to the following season. But it was just knocked on the head as, uh, as, as soon as we came back to the pre-season. I mean, did you think that City team deserved to get relegated? Because obviously it was only one point that sent you down. So, Pro prob Probably not. But as everybody says, at the end of the season, the, the league tables... Don't lie, does it? And I, I think it was, um, there were quite a few things going on, sort of players were leaving, 
who were trying to force the youngsters into the team. It was a bit disjointed. Um, and I think it certainly doesn't help when you have a manager leave, you have the assistant manager that takes over and then upsets, upsets more players. And, mm. and I know, and I, know um, uh, I think Andy May was, was one of the players that, uh, that I've spoken to in, in, in recent months. Uh, again, he, he was literally told probably a month, two months after I, after I left. Uh, yeah. but there's, there's no future for you at City and you were City through and through so yeah. it, it was as if the management or the coaches were trying to get players that they didn't like out and trying to get and trying to push the youngsters in yeah. and when, when you do that unless you're lucky very very lucky and, and like Man United where you put five or six of them in together and it gels then that, that's a one off um, yeah. And you get the, the, the players, you get the players that come through a couple of years, uh, twelve months later, eighteen months later, and they were a hell of a crop of youngsters. They just, yeah. just need, in my opinion, they just needed to be drip fed into that first team, yeah. and, then, and then it would gel. Obviously, it did, uh, seasons later, because uh, they 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 came back up, but. Um, it was a, it was tough for a few seasons. See, I'm glad we've took. I mean, we'll get back to this in a minute, but I'm glad we've touched on this, Gordon, because I'd like your opinion on it. Because um, I'm a big believer in, um, like you say, drip feeding youth into the team, and I don't think like, oh, he should start because he's from academy, or oh yeah, drop him, get this academy player on who might be the next bit best thing. I, I'm yeah. just not a believer in that. And I have this argument with people all the time. Like, oh, well, Doyle should be starting over Gundogan. Gundogan's boring. Or he, Foden's better than him. But being in the dressing room and it, you being the senior pro getting dropped for this 18-year-old, it must... Am I right in thinking it does rock the boat? Because obviously that senior, like, that senior pro's makes with three other senior pros in dressing room. Do you get what I mean? Am I right in thinking that or am I missing the point? No, um, I think you, you're right if you have what everybody calls, if there's a little click in the changing yeah. room and you've got three or four or five of them who are always together and yeah. they'll have a, have a drink outside together. Um, it, <coughs> it, to me, it, it didn't bother <coughs> me about being brought for an 18-year-old, a 19-year-old, a 16-year-old. Yeah. Um, because I had the attitude that I wanted to fight to get my place back. I just didn't want to sit in the reserves for two months yeah. waiting for this 16-year-old to get injured. Um, yeah. I w I, I'd look at it very realistically um, yeah. in, in that nobody's guaranteed a spot unless you're captain. Nobody's yeah. guaranteed a spot in the team if you're not performing. Yeah. I think if you're performing and you're dropped, then you start wondering what's going on, but, I, but but there are certain dressing rooms that I've been in where there's there's cliques, there's players that don't like each other off the pitch, but on the pitch you get on because it's your job. Yeah. Um, but I, I I've always thought with regards to uh, the youngsters the same way that, that you thought uh, is that you've got to gradually introduce him. You, you might get the odd one every now and again. You put mm. him in and he just, he just he doesn't look out of place. And, no. and he keeps his position and he starts actually building up a relationship with one, two, three players around him in that team. Um, yes. And, and you, you, you look at him and you think, this, kid, this kid's got it. And yes. he's going to be even better in three or four years. Um, yeah. but when you put them all in together, and yes, you've got the experienced heads there, then sometimes there's only so many people you can have a go at during 90 minutes. Yeah. If you start having a go at one person, fine. But if there's four or five that are not performing, you know that they're trying and they're yeah. giving you 100%, but they're not quite there it yet. It's difficult because you just don't want three or four of the youngsters dropping their heads uh, or yeah. trying to impress. Because when you're trying to impress, you start forcing it. And when you do yeah. anything with any job at all, 
if you start forcing it, that's when you start making mistakes. You should do yeah. what you're good at, what you're renowned for, and then you you keep your place in the team and you get more experience. But, but yeah, I've, I've been in, in um, uh, dressing rooms on both sides of it, but uh, it's a click and you know that these, these four are going to stick together. And yeah. then I've been in dressing rooms that you just get on like a house on fire. And that's from one to 16. Yeah. So just jumping back to the squad, the city squad you were in, uh, Gordon. Yeah. Now, uh, did you think Mick McCarthy was going to be the manager he was, he is now, with the career he's ground out? I think if you look at most defenders, uh, and, and there's, it's amazing when we were playing how many defenders ended up going into management. Uh, whether it's because they're standing there at the back and they can see everything that's going on in front of them. Yeah. There weren't many forwards going into uh, coaching or management jobs. Uh, and, and some of those excellent players who were forwards went into management jobs and didn't do really well. Yeah. So whether it was a, defen a defensive point of view, uh, but you knew that uh, Mick was very straightforward. Um, he, he generally call a spade a spade. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you're allowed to say that these days. Um, but if you did something wrong, uh, he'd be only too happy to shout at you from 50 yards away on the pitch. Uh, yeah. And he'd be too happy to have a go at you in the changing room. And, and yeah. then you've either got to stand up for yourself or you've got to tell him why he's wrong. But you could see the way that he... Um, um, if I say handle himself, then... Yeah. Out, out of all the players, you probably would have, would have said that Mick would have been one that was definitely going into uh, management, not necessarily coaching, because sometimes mm. that's confusing people and this and that. But um, with his forthright attitude, you could see him being some sort of manager. Um, and the way that he's turned out as a manager, then, yeah, that's how he was as a player. He was straight yeah. talking. He'd look you in the eye and, and, and call you rotten if he'd done something. And uh, that's the way he manages. Well, he's a Yorkshireman, isn't he? And I bet he could not boot back <laughs> and make a drink. Now, this is my uh, favourite question for all my guests, Gordon. Right. You've got, uh, you're going on a, a big night out, top, yeah. top boozing, it's 10 fight minimum. Who's the five city players you're going out with, back in your, from your team? Um, you probably... Kenny Clements. Yeah. Be, um, oh, God. I've got a... Neil McNabb. Scott. Scott. They can always drink, can't they? Well, well, yeah. Of course, when I went there, you had um, uh, Jim Melrose and Jim Tolmy as well. But, uh, <laughs> but, I, but, I never, but, but I never went out with those drinking. Um, definitely Kenny Clements. Um... Oh, who was the uh, who was the big goalkeeper? Not Alex Williams. Eric Nixon. He'd been he'd been at one. Um, Mark Lewis. That's three because uh, his nickname was Booner. He loved a curry and a pint. <laughs> Is that what his nickname was? <laughs> nickname was Booner. Yeah, and that's what we called him on the pitch as well. Um, <laughs> so that's that's three. Um, God, it wouldn't wouldn't be Neil McNabb, wouldn't be Graham Baker, wouldn't be Paul Simpson. Um, Paul Powell, think... were he there? What's that? Paul Powell, Paul Power, even sorry. Well, Paul Powell was there, but I I I, I wouldn't have said that Paul was a big drinker. Um, he was um, uh, a, a bit like me. He went on to further education. He had a, he had a few, <laughs> too many brain cells up here to, to drink ten pints. Um, so at the moment I've only got I've only got four, haven't I? Uh, three. I'm surprised at this, uh, Gordon. I thought you'd have said I thought it'd have been you had to narrow it down from the eleven, not uh, oh, having to no, think no, about no. it. No, it was uh, pro probably Nicky Reed. He, yeah. he, he, he was he was a quiet assassin at times, and <laughs> you, you couldn't you couldn't tell if he had one pint or ten pints. Um, <laughs> You, but you certainly didn't want to get on the on the wrong side of him. Um, so that, that that's probably the five. So Mixon, Clements, Reed, 
Uh, Lillis. Oh, there's got to be one more. There's got to be one more. I thought McCarthy would have been a bullser. No, he was... Uh, Mick, Mick never got any louder than what he was, and he was he was loud before he had one pint, so he couldn't <laughs> anyway. But um, but but that's the that's the first team. And who else? Who am I gonna Who am I gonna drop in it? Um, yeah, David White. I know we're a bit young for you then, but David White's a boozer now. <laughs> well, well, I was gonna I was gonna say I'll, I'll go I'll, I'll stick Whitey in there only because I've seen a photograph of him and he's obviously hit the booze a bit. <laughs> Since he's finished playing, <laughs> he's like, I had a few fights for him at the beginning of the season. <laughs> so yeah. I can get, I can tell you. So, uh, yeah, oh, I'm good. Um, yeah. So talking about City now, Gordon, do yeah. um, do they like a lot of people, a lot of non-City fans say how City's lost their um, identity. Now, from what I gather. I think if you play for City, no matter what, they will still have your back, still be good to you. Am I right in thinking that, with, even with you? Or Yeah, yeah. They, they, every time that Fulham have played City, whether it's in the league, um, when we were in the Premier League, or whether it's in the Cup game, as I mentioned earlier on, um, I, I get an invitation to come back up to, to watch the game, to have a bit of a, like a corporate hospitality day. And... Um, uh, I'm I'm welcomed uh, with open arms back back at the city by the staff that are there, and of course they're all young staff. They've never seen me play, but they 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 know the name. I'm on a list that that goes round and round and round. Um, I'm well looked after on the day, uh, and what I do like is obviously the 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 supporters who stand near the ticket office, not far from the main entrance. They, somehow it, the word gets out with this by the club that, uh, for instance, we're playing Fulham this week and Gordon Davis, yeah, excellent player, is coming up. Um, and the amount of supporters that stand near, if I say the ticket office where I need to pick my tickets up, um, it, it's amazing because I've changed a lot. Um, yeah. We've only seen photographs of what I used to look like, but it was yeah. dark. It was dark with <laughs> So I've changed a hell of a lot, but uh, the city supporters, they still get their, their, their pictures out, they still get their magazines out, the, photo the, the photographs of me in a city kit uh, yeah. or in a city book, book um, and they're, they're ever so nice and they, they, they want me to sign everything that they bring out. And they are, to me, considering I was only there one, one season, exactly 12 months, um, they always thank me for, for what I did for City. Um, they, they always sort of are pleased with what I, what I did and what I've said about City in, in years gone by. And it's, it's just like, if I say going home, because mm. you're, ac you're accepted as a City yeah. player. Um, yeah. God, God knows what it would have been like if I'd stayed there for 10 years. Um, yeah. But, uh, but it, it's just nice to go back up there uh, and... I, we always go out on the on the stage to do the interviews yeah. uh, before the game. Um, so it's it, it's like going back home. And um, because I'm still a city supporter, it's great to go up there. Um, I, it's it's a fantastic stadium, but there's no atmosphere there as the atmosphere was at Main Road, and no. that that's I think not something that could hold them back, but when you generate that, that atmosphere and if they've got enough money and it would be great if they just put a roof on it and, and kept the sound inside. Yeah. But it always appears, um, apart from the big games, and I'll say this because obviously I go there with Fulham, there's maybe 500 Fulham supporters right up in the top right-hand yeah. corner and a half, half to three-quarter filled stadium. Yeah. But if it's rocking against Man United or Liverpool or Chelsea or Real Madrid in Europe, um, then it's a different kettle of fish because when I go up there with Fulham, half the people that are supporting City go there because they're season ticket holders. Yeah. They can't get excited because really, deep down, they know they're going to beat us. 
Yeah. It's not that it's going to be, be end to end and it's going to be four, three, five, four. Um, so I think sometimes when you, you've got as good as City are now, it's difficult for the supporters to, to raise it when basically yeah. you know you're going to win because they win at home virtually every week of the year and it just becomes the norm. So yeah. it's just a I big mean, game that, that uh, they get up for it, I think. I've been a season ticket holder now, Gordon, since they came to the Etihad. Yeah. And uh, literally, the first six seasons, we were all like, next year, the atmosphere will be better. Next year, the atmosphere will be better. And got like, I, I've tried, uh, we've tried organising things and that. But for whatever reason, that atmosphere just does not take off. I could count on my hand uh, how many times the atmosphere has been bouncing in there. But... Yeah. I remember playing Fulham a few years ago because I used to sit in it, I used to sit like band next to away fans. So I'm, I'm there where you're like 60, yeah. 600 Fulham fans. And I started shouting, You only came in a taxi. <laughs> and all, everybody was singing it to him. <laughs> so uh, yeah, now he's your Fulham the lad. But... That's the thing, it's the, it's the banter as well. And it would be nice if they trialed some of the. Uh, like this, the, the, the standing that you can turn into seats yeah. and, and have behind one of the goals just all standing but two, two games later it's all seating and just get the, the city supporters standing up in one area who wants to go in that area because of course everybody that used to sing together or shout together has Can't been split, to has split up all around and of course it, it's Bloody, it's bloody difficult to sit down and start singing songs. You've got yeah. to be standing up to sing, to sing songs. Yeah. And that's the, I think that's a big problem with the stadium. The sooner they get one end or two ends that are this seating standing area, then I think it, it could change. But certainly, I think the majority of the, the atmosphere there is... is it, when I go up there with Fulham, it, it's dead. Mm. See, I think it's also... A bit of a generational thing. I think the diehards, a lot of the diehards are a bit older and a lot of the, the new generation coming through are a bit plastic. I'm sort of like the middle ground. Do, do you get what I mean? Like being 30, I knew it when we were shit and now I know when we're good. Now, I mean, I've, I've told this story on my podcast before, but I'm going to tell it you, Gordon, because you haven't heard it. So, okay. um, I won some tickets. Uh, to go to City v Schalke at home. Uh, our young, they took our young on City Square, give me some free tickets. They're only six months old. Anyway, so I, I took my mate, uh, I think it was the six, fifth, sixth, seventh goal, and it, Phil Foden scored. Yeah. And now we're in the family stand. He run, like, I could practically touch him. So I stood up, I'm cheering, he's celebrating, buzzing, his first Champions League goal. A guy behind me says, sit down, mate. Come on, sit down. You're ruining it for everybody. And we just scored. And he's telling me to sit down. Now, how are you going to get a song going when there's a bloke behind you telling you to sit down when you scored? It's madness, isn't it? It is. Fulham supporters are quiet anyway. And I've been saying for, for 20 years, they need to stick a dynamite up their backside to get them going, even at home games. Um, but it's one of those... Situations, and I think you, you you probably hit the nail on the head. The way that the Premier League has gone, you've got bigger bigger crowds, but you've got a completely different set of supporters coming into that one area. And yeah. even at Fulham now, they're trying to uh, get songs going, but because everybody's sitting down and the people are trying to get the songs going, there might be 40 over on the left, and then there's 20, 30 seats away. Yeah. It's very, it's very, very difficult. And, and of course, if you've got the stewards doing their job, as soon as one person stands up. Yeah. I it, mean, it's just, uh, the Etihad got a bit on the football ground. To, you're not supposed to enjoy the game. You're supposed <laughs> yeah. to sit down and watch it and clap yeah. after 45 minutes and clap after 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah. But Etihad must be the only stadium, Gordon, where if there's no away fans, they sing against each other. South Stand and East Stand start arguing. I've never known no like it. <laughs> but, um, right, what fuck time we are. So, that's an hour, Gordon. 
so no. I'm going to wrap it up. But, okay. Right, stay on and we'll have a bit of an off air chat. So I'll just do okay. my thing, stop recording. So then, Blues, that's uh, my interview with uh, Gordon Davis. Hi. And uh, do the usual, lads. Like, subscribe, comment, share it with your friends. Anything, anything you do really, really does help the cause. Thanks, Blue. See you again.